All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited that Joseph Bethanti is with us tonight uh, for a poetry reading, a celebration of language and literature. Uh, as you may know, Joseph Bethanti is the poet laureate of North Carolina. And as I've told my classes, you don't just wake up and decide, hey, I think I'll be the poet laureate. It's a process of uh, chosen. Uh, you go through kind of a he talked to us about it earlier, kind of nomination and what are you going to do with your project and these kinds of things. Um, once you're the poet laureate, um, you have to go around and speak to different groups, talk about poetry, um, promote literacy and these kinds of things in the state. Previous poet laureates have been Fred Chapel, Catherine Stripling Byer, uh, most recently Kathy Smith Bowers and Joseph Bethanti came on board in September of 2012. Uh, Joseph Bethanti is a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He holds a BA and MA from the University of Pittsburgh and an MFA from Warren Wilson College. He came to North Carolina as a member of VISTA and worked in Huntersville Prison in Mecklenburg County and kind of been here ever since. Um, his books include Anson County, This Metal, Land of Amnesia, and Restoring Sacred Art. He's received many awards for his work. Of his work, um, Randall Keenan said, his award-winning body of work is a powerful mix of old forms and new forms, which has gained national and international recognition, and which adds up to a rich interpretation of modern American life. Uh, Department of Cultural Resources Secretary Linda Carlisle said, Joseph Bethanti brings a deep appreciation of our state's diverse communities, geographies, and traditions to his new role as an ambassador of North Carolina literature, his appointment as Poet Laureate is a wonderful new chapter in North Carolina's rich literary history. He'll be reading from some of his books tonight. He will also be selling books afterwards and signing them. He'll be taking some questions. So look forward to it, and I think you'll enjoy what he has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, all the members of the English department here at Rockingham that have been taking such good care of me. I was in a Ms. Sykes creative writing class this afternoon, and uh, how fabulous. So it's good to be here. I've been here twice before. Um, I teach at Appalachian State in Boone, and I teach creative writing. So. I'm going to read and just kind of ramble around and leave plenty of time for questions that I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to answer. I'm going to start out by reading a poem called Wheeling um, for Wheeling, West Virginia. I grew up in, in Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania. It's in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. And not far from Pittsburgh is Wheeling. So growing up, the, the legal drinking age in Pennsylvania was 21, and the legal drinking age in Wheeling was 18. So I think you know the rest of the story. Um, it, so it was not unusual, and I'm sure it isn't unusual in those kinds of states who should be having dialogue about the disparity in drinking ages for kids who can't drink legally in their home state to cross the line go to the neighboring state where they can drink legally, but of course the complicating factor is those kids have to get back back home safely. Um, I certainly don't want to give the idea that the person in this poem is me, <laughs> lest you tell the governor. Um, but those of you who study poetry know that the narrator in a poem is called a speaker. And I think the poem pretty much speaks for itself. Um, but I will tell you this much. It's about a kid who borrows a car and takes a girl with him to West Virginia to kind of carry on. And this girl, her father, hates this kid. Wheeling. Driving a girl whose father loathed me, son of an Italian who labored on the open hearth, I crossed in a borrowed green comet the PA line into Wheeling. 18 was legal in West Virginia. Marlboro's and 3-2 beer at the hilltop on a street with whorehouses and a Jesuit college. She was 16, a miner, the true miner secreted in black sulfurous pockets, whispering beneath the tavern floor we sat upon. 
The jukebox was loud and country. It was easy to ignore the charge being laced under us. My girl was drunk and singing along. Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette, though she didn't know the words. The way folks mouth like speaking in tongues when the spirit lays hold of them. <clears throat> A smudge on her cheek, secondhand coat, her blonde hair shone white, and in that light aged into a coal miner's wife or a steel worker's, like my mother. When the 4 to 12 shift from Wheeling, Pittsburgh dragged in, I smelled asbestos and baked ore, the vaporous green sizzle of my father's work fatigues. I wanted to tell her all about her father. I'd rip him to pieces, that bastard. My dad was a brave man. He climbed boom cranes with nothing but a span of leather fastening him above the smokestacks streaming 12 stories of fire into the firmament, but I had no vocabulary to render his mythic toil. I knew more about her dad, his suits, an office in downtown Pittsburgh, his perfect diction in college education. We hung around till last call, then kissed against the fender until the lot emptied and the hilltop's neon shingle sputtered out. The comet wouldn't start. I turned it over and over until I killed the battery, till I couldn't get a peep out of the horn or the lights to flicker. The mighty Ohio beat by. Whelped in Pittsburgh, it loops north in defiance of gravity, abruptly slices west, southering into the fang of northern West Virginia that impales the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania like the long, jagged neck of a busted bottle. That's where we stood clinging to each other, stranded along the omniscient river, where I still like to think of us before those miners, like escaped purgatorians, burst black and smoldering through the bottom of our lives. And she started to cry, anticipating her father's patrician wrath. I thought of who I could call, knowing there was only one man on earth who would rise out of his exhausted sleep at the sound of my voice, like Lazarus and come running. And of course, that person was my father, um, who didn't ask any questions then. But that, that's all I needed then, was for him to ask no questions then. I was prepared to face the music later. Um, so in that vein, I'm going to read a poem about my dad. My father was a steel worker in Pittsburgh. He worked for 47 years at a mill called Edgar Thompson Works in Braddock, PA. It was the first mill that Andrew Carnegie opened in America. Um, and the poem is called Knocked, okay? But it's not this kind of knocked. It's when there's a saying that he's got it knocked, and it's the same as he's got it made. And I would hear my dad say that sometimes, he's got it made. So I didn't know anything about really what my dad did for a living, except that he worked in a steel mill. I didn't know exactly what a steel mill was. I didn't know what he did. Um, in other words, I took him for granted, um, just like we do with our parents. It's, it's, it's an age-old practice. And some of you who are probably in 113, literature-based research, I believe, might have read the poem by Robert Hayden called Those Winter Sundays that, that ends with, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? And that's something we only find out once, once we're parents ourselves. So I only saw this mill of my dad's. Um, I saw it for the first time when I was 17 because I needed to keep the car. We just had one car back then. I guess everybody uh, just had one car back then. And, and a lot of people had no cars. It was a uh, 63 Chevy Bel Air, um, a great car. That's what I learned to drive on. Um, and so I took him to the mill and dropped him off early one morning because I wanted to keep the car for the rest of the day to go to my senior after prom picnic. Knocked. I was 17 before I saw Edgar Thompson, the steel mill where my father had worked since he was 17, and only then because I needed his car for the senior after prom picnic. The theme was color my world. Sleepless 
having danced all night a furnace of cheap champagne and still in my tuxedo. I dropped him off at 7 a.m. in Braddock, named for a revolutionary war general. Three bars in every block, street lights, turned on in the afternoon so the school kids could see their ways home through the ore dust. The mill was blue and corrugated, rising in shaft after shaft of smoke that saw-toothed into gray sky. I never saw its top. The men in the boom crane cabs wore hard hats and drank coffee. They had it knocked, my father said, but not him. He had to climb the backs of those monsters. When I was little and insisted I wanted to be like him and work in the mill, he'd snap, no, you're not. You're going to college. In a few months, I really would be going to college. Working in a steel mill was the last thing I wanted to do. My father eased out of the car, handed me a 20, told me to be careful, pinned on his mill rights badge and filed into the smoke with the others. I turned up the radio, dropped the engine into low for torque and floored it, sure that in one night I'd had more fun, more love, more everything than he had had in his life, and I wanted to get back to it as fast as I could. It takes a long time to really realize, you know, we hear a whole lot about what a real man is, and, you know, a real man is somebody who goes to work every day in a lot of ways, you know, and supports, you know, supports his children and his, and his family, you know. That, I mean, that's real bravery. That's real integrity. That's real constance. So in that vein, you know, let me change it up just a tiny bit. It, it, is, it is basketball season, you know. Um, they play basketball in North Carolina. So I thought I'd read a basketball poem. I'm going to read two basketball poems. And some of you, I hope some of you kick around the idea of writing. Um, I write a whole lot about sports, you know, a whole lot. So any subject fits the vessel of poetry, you know. It's not just those big abstracts like love and hate and death and things, you know. There's all sorts of narrative um, that, f that fit into it. Your, your lives, um, your lives really fit into it. Um, this poem's called Jojo. It's about a, a, a kid that I went to high school with. His name, was Joe, his name is Joe Costanzo. I still see him. A lot of my best friends are the kids I grew up with. Um, a lot of them still back in Pittsburgh. So he was our, our great basketball player. You know how every, you know, every 15 kids on a basketball team, usually, you know, there's one or two who are the stars. So he was really, he was all everything, all Catholic League, all Western Pennsylvania. And I went to a school with 1,600 boys too, just boys. So it was very competitive. Um, and in, in case I don't impress you as a poet, I played on the same foot, high school football team as Dan Marino. Um, and another teammate of mine is the current uh, special teams coordinator for the Steelers, Danny Smith. Um, and there's more, but I'll, I'll save it. I'll see how I'm doing with the poetry before I start bragging about that. Um, all you need to know about this poem called Jojo is that in it, um, there's an instance where somebody gets up and imitates the coach's voice, which I think is another universal. We all learn to imitate our teacher's voices and our coach's voices. But Mr. Killian was the coach, and he had one of those voices that just was tailor-made to be imitated. I could almost do it now, but I'll save impressions for later, too. Jojo. It's late, late in the game. We're playing Canavan in our gym, a bandbox so small the people sitting on the bottom bleachers squat to keep their feet off the inbounds. Less than 20 seconds and Central's down one. Joe Costanzo's bringing the ball up. Coach Killian's on his feet. Every kid in the school can do an imitation of his voice. Jojo loves having the ball. Can't keep his hands off it really in the outside shot is his trope. A kind of two-hand, knock-kneed jumper, but he never actually gets off the floor. The ball with a lot of arc leaving his hands, which twist counterclockwise. Giving it a reverse English as it snaps through the hoop. The net cracking like a stick then turns itself inside out, and the ref has to get it back down by throwing the ball up through the underside of the rim. Joe shoots a lot, more than he has to, but he can score. On a good night, he hardly misses. He'll throw in 40, 50, 
He's captain, all Catholic, all Western PA, totally conscious of every move he makes. He's invented himself and pulled it off. You can see it when the team comes out to warm up the way he swoops in for his layups as sweet Georgia Brown blares over the PA and Central's tiny gym begins to rock. Joe's a sweet guy, no denying. Number 44 in your program, number one in your heart. He signs everyone's yearbook. The clock shows 15 seconds. There's time to work it into one of the big guys for something close. Draw the foul, two from the line, at least one and one. Tie it up, overtime, play the percentages. Canavan's working a half-court man press, so they pick up at center court. JoJo right in the middle of the jump circle, dribbling, the clock dwindling. When Russ Benko, one of Joe's boyhood friends from St. Rosalia's in Greenfield, everyone's standing now, banging the bleachers with their heels. The whole gym literally vibrating, the walls sweating. Russ yells in his best Mr. Killian imitation. There's nobody better at it. You'd think it was him. His wife would think it was him. Russ yells, shoot it, JoJo, shoot it. And JoJo, the dead half court with a guy all over him, never hesitates, just throws it up with that quirky twist, way up, the ball seeming to spin in six different directions. Killian can't believe it. Bending over and beating his thighs with his fists, squeezing his head between his hands. He's going to kill JoJo. A cockeyed half-court jumper with a man open under the boards. Jesus. It goes in without touching the rim. As if there were no rim. Just an invisible hole in the air that only JoJo and the ball know about. The net there simply to swoon like lace on its halo of orange steel. And uh, let me read another basketball poem. Um, Hannah mentioned that, I, that I've done a lot of work in prisons. I, I came to North Carolina in 1976 as a VISTA volunteer. Um, I had just gotten out of grad school at the University of Pittsburgh. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but the list of things I didn't want to do stretched from here to California, you know. So I know people are going to pester you. You're probably getting ready to graduate here, or you're just here, and you're, you might have just gotten here, you know, and you might be transferring. Um, I hope you are. I hope you continue your schooling. It's... It might be a cliche, but Lord have mercy, it's a true one. You know, knowledge is power, reading and writing, open doors, period, end of story. Um, so people are going to be pestering you about what you're going to do. And don't feel terrifically anxious if you don't know. Often, as Frost says, way leads on to way. And sometimes you find out what you're going to do once you start doing it. Um, it'll all be okay. You're in the right place now. Um, so this is a long way of, long-winded way of introducing the poem. So I, I've, I've spent 37 years teaching creative writing in, in prison. Um, and one of the things I did as a VISTA volunteer is I coached the inmate softball and basketball teams. But I also played on the guard team against the inmates, even though I was constitutionally more suited toward the inmates, to tell you the truth. Um, Fabulous, a lot of fabulous athletes in prison. Um, a lot of really good, good athletes. Um, so that when the inmates played the guards in basketball, the inmates would kill, annihilate the guards. It was like, I don't know, five Michael Jordans versus, I don't know, five really overweight, ancient Farmer Browns, man. And they just like, went coast to coast on those guys, and they were just, you know, completely out of their element. But they were the guards, you know, and it was the inmates' way of getting back at them, too, kind of legally putting it to them, but then the guards would get kind of ugly, you know. So this poem is just, is called Flate, F-L-A-T-E, which is somebody's name, actually. And it's about basketball. His Christian name was Flate. But they called him Flight, fly mainly. Six eight, 
with hands so big, fingers so long, they looked drawn on by Romir Bearden. He was black, his Rhodesia, and nobody, garden or convict in the South Piedmont area, could even half shadow him on a hoop court. He had a full ride to Barber, Scotia, and Concord before he busted into a funeral home, jonesing for formaldehyde one night and caught this time. When Flates Five from the Camp Tar Squad played the guards at the old Huntersville High Gym, Sergeant Ford took Fly Man and they rigged the box and won. Ford was all county at Garringer in 69, but Fly was something extra over. Each time he schooled Ford, the Camp Five keened like a choir, chanting death deathless junk that befuddled the guards. Ford's screws threw their towels and insulted the ref. They started playing dirty, but the convicts took it. Nothing they didn't know about dirty. Fly never betrayed the game, stuck to the facts, dribbled like sharpening a shank. The ball in his hand was a ripe, astonished peach. It simply disappeared, his leap an exaggeration in the rafters, all sky, then whoom, two more for the bad guys. At least one baseball poem, and then, you know, I'll kind of move on. Um, forgive me for the title of this poem. It's called Son of a Bitch. And I'm not trying to really be a smart aleck. And then I have to repeat it twice in the poem. Um, and it's about playing Little League. My dad was my baseball coach, and my dad, my dad was just a, a lovely man, you know, just a really good, good man um, who never gave me a hard time about anything um, unless I, you know, when, when he did, it was, it was fine because I had it coming. Um, just a gentle man, wonderful father, truly. So he was my coach, um, and then the other coach was a guy named Al Petro who was not a very nice man, and he had a son my age that I went to school with named Johnny. And Johnny was no good. He was just not a, he was, he wasn't an athlete. He wasn't a kid who was interested in sports. And those kids exist, and it's really okay. But often parents, more likely than, than not, fathers want to somehow vicariously live through the daring do of their child's athletics. So Johnny didn't want to be on that field, and his dad was just horrible to the kid because he was no good. Now, we knew Johnny wasn't any good, and it was important to be good in sports in my neighborhood, but he was still one of us, so we despised his father, you know, when he, when he picked on him like that. And I heard adults call um, Al what the title of this poem is. I don't want to have to say it too many times, especially since I'm being videotaped, you know. But you know what it's called. Johnny Petro's dad, Al, was a son of a bitch. His fellow coaches, including my father, had no use for him. Excluded, red-faced, he looked like Lee Harvey Oswald. Get in front of it, Al commanded, forbidding Johnny to flinch as he clubbed him vicious grounders with his big Hillerick and Bradsby 35, a cigarette stealing out of his mouth like a bullet, the ball tearing rabid along the minefield. Take it in your chest. What are you afraid of? My father had known Al for years, but said little aside from the times often enough when Al crucified Johnny because of a boot or strikeout. My dad would tell him to let up, and Al would wheel menacingly, then smile when he saw who it was. I thought it took something secret to brand a man, son of a bitch, murder or sins of impurity, more than baseball, more than fathering a boy who couldn't catch, had no arm, no swing, a boy smart enough, too smart, Al would mutter, to realize there was no future in 1963 on that glassy, pocked field down on Larmer Avenue. Are you a statue, Al would bellow, in the middle of an inning when a ball shot by Johnny, then mimic his son standing motionless, head hanging, arms drooped at his sides, the two of them identical, still as marble, except for the boy's squint, 
behind his glasses. And I'm going to read one more baseball poem, Sports Night. And then, and then I'll stop. Um, this, this is a poem that is in, in the voice of, uh, of a woman. It's a woman speaker. The poem is called Washing Her Ruined Boy, and it's a, it's a mom giving, let's say, her, her little eager, like a kid who's seven, a bath after he comes home from losing a ball game and is just terrifically inconsolable the way little kids can be when something bad happens to them. Um, and I think, too, it's interesting because uh, little boys um, will sometimes be vulnerable in front of their mothers in ways they won't be in front of their fathers. You know, the genders, we all have different relationships with our parents. It doesn't necessarily mean we love one better than the other, but um, maybe you can tell your, you know, there were things, I, again, I had this very general dad, but there were things that I would go to my mother about because I didn't want to ever betray to my dad just because we were boys, if you will, that, uh, I don't know. that I had any weaknesses at all. Although, of course, he knew all that without my telling him. Anyhow, this is called Washing Her Ruined Boy. That he would not cry this way in front of his father is no measure of greater love. He simply apportions me what is mine. As I run his bath, I watch him through the mirror, yanks piped gravely across his chest in maroon block as he undresses. He's smooth and pretty as his sister, but unlike her, he covets fame's witness. I can hardly lift him over the lip of the tub where his regatta lists, dry docked and forgotten. Tonight he does not buck my cleansing hand, but leans into it, crying as I bathe him, still not sure that what he's assailed by is loss, for what is there to lose in seven years? Already he's bent on making this morning his life. Each night he prays to be a champion. I yearn to tell him he is right to despair as I towel and wrap him, languid, weeping across my knees, wondering if tonight he'll cry out and sleep as he kicks that same elusive grounder through his dreams. The one he's told me over and over, incredulous that something bad could happen, that had all the world to choose, yet chose the earth he stood on to pluck off and ruin him. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a really short, short story, a short, short story. It's called Driving. Um, it's from this book of mine called The High Heart. It's 14 stories. They're all interrelated. They're a cycle of stories, same characters. It's narrated by a kid named Fritz Sweeney. Um, his mom is, is kind of a very fiery Italian woman, and his dad is a very Pacific, low-key um, Irishman. Again, it's called driving. When I turned 16, my mother insisted I learn how to operate an automobile. My father didn't drive, something my mother held against him, just as she did the fact that he did all the cooking and was addicted to the newspaper and made predictions often dead center about which way the world in 1971 would lurch. A man had to drive a car. One morning, she woke me at 3 a.m. after she and my father blew in from their restaurant jobs. Illuminated by the pale light from the hall behind her, she hovered over my bed like a giant moth arms spread cruciform in the mammoth sleeves of her short, furry leopard jacket, its spots invisible in the murk, her head voluminous, webbed in high teased hair through which cracks of light leaked. I smelled liquor, lipstick, and hairspray, the latent rank and cloy of eight hours on her feet, followed by a string of nightcaps with my dad and some friends after he clocked out from waiting tables just up the street. Get dressed. You're learning how to drive, she commanded. My dad stood out in the hall under the light bulb. He had already had a say on this subject, and my mother had paid no attention. I could see this by the way he undid his bow tie, then his shirt, going down those buttons, like he was playing the last sad notes on a sax. Last call, 
no one around to listen. God, Rita, let the boy sleep, he said. He's learning to drive, she pronounced. He's not going to grow up to be helpless like you. She closed my door behind her, then badgered me into my clothes from the other side of it while she and my dad sniped at each other. He was a gutless wonder. She was a princess. He could kiss her ass. He admired her ass, especially the way she substituted it for brains. <coughs> Dressed, I opened the door, and there they were. My mother on tiptoe, those big calf muscles bulging under the sheen of her high white patent leather zippered go-go's, arms up around my dad's neck, his hands on her hips, shirt unbuttoned and unknotted maroon bow tie still dangling from his neck like the confessor stole. Her leopard lay crouched on the floor, short, lacy, black dress, flimsy from the waist up. Then, as if on cue, like they had rehearsed, they stopped kissing and wheeled on me. Get your ass in the car, my mother said, and peeled off my father. I'm teaching you to drive. <laughs> Rita, you couldn't teach a man on fire to jump in a swimming pool, snapped my dad. Then I'll die trying, she fired back, then winked at me. My dad laughed and said very plainly, large mistake, then disappeared into their bedroom across the hall. My mother sped down Negley Run Boulevard with her left arm out the window. With her right hand, she clutched the steering wheel in a lit Chesterfield. Just before we hit Washington Boulevard, she slowed to a crawl and bumped the car over the curb into a massive grassy field at the edge of the three-story tower used to teach firemen how to jump out of burning buildings. The tower was bathed in spotlights, and beneath it was a huge net. Firemen decked in full turnout plunged off the edge of the tower one after another, but we couldn't see them land because of the trees in the foreground. Why are they doing that in the middle of the night, I wondered out loud. This is when most fires start, my mother answered, then doused the headlights and switched off the ignition. Get behind the wheel. Our car was a used beige 61 Chevy Impala with a three-speed on the column. I didn't know what an Impala was. I'm sure my mother didn't either. In the nearly full moon, the keys and the chrome and the car's interior pulsed smokily like extinguished neon. My mother demonstrated how the car started, the flick of the key in the ignition, how just the slightest pressure on the throttle was enough, often more than enough, to hurl you into the future. But as long as you had the clutch and the brake clamped hard against the floor, nothing bad could happen. She ordered me to engage the clutch. Then with her hand on mine, she guided me through the gears in their intricate relationship with speed and regret. Delicate was the word she used in the moonlight, smoking a cigarette while a stream of men flew off the tower. Then she whispered suddenly, Fritzy, I'm finished. She dropped her cigarette out the window. She couldn't go on a moment more. If I ever wanted to see home again, then I had to drive us there myself. Did I understand? Things, she said, are that desperate. But everything, every little thing, Fritzy, will be fixed, put back together, I promise, if you'll drive me home. I want to go home now. Then she began to cry, an indulgence she never permitted herself. Mom, I don't know how to drive. I don't even have a learner's permit. You can drive, Fritz. I just taught you. You're going to be a man not like your father, and take me home, then everything, God damn it, will be fine. Crying so hard she could barely get her breath, gagging out the words. I fired up the car, patted in the clutch, dropped the stick into the lower left leg of the mysterious H of the gearbox, transferred my right foot from brake to throttle, and caressed the gas. I eased up on the clutch and clearly felt it, that in-betweenness my mother had described, the just before that's always better than what's about to happen. I slid my shoe off the clutch and hit the gas. With a ravenous hiss, the Impala lifted off the earth.
Okay. I want to read a poem called uh, Mysterium Tremendum. It's just Latin for big mystery, essentially. Um, I was at doing something at East Carolina University down in Pitt County in Greenville. I had my family with me. My kids were little. We were on one of those five lanes in a hotel, and I just decided I was going to get a cup of coffee. So I walked across the five lane into a McDonald's to get some coffee, and the person in line ahead of me robbed the store. I mean, these things happen. In Greenville, North Carolina, I leave my hotel room. It's witness of anonymity. Telephone, remote, microwave, pristine, glossy Gideon secreted in the nightstand like a straight razor. Accept the evening's invitation, its cool, dark hand in mine, the lascivious flicker of its middle finger against my palm, and cross the neon boulevard for coffee. In line ahead of me, just one guy, tall, ascetic, cowed in red and black, Atlanta Falcons hoodie, the angry bird of prey just to his back like a hex sign. He orders two apple pies, hands the clerk in pinstripes and wide herb tie a five. When she opens the drawer for change, he strikes across the counter, swoops up the green bills, those eluding him fluttering in the updraft, rows of cups and cutlery behind the woozy clerk, toppling the slow, silent, filmic tumult of a miracle as the robber, a kid, beautiful as a Trappist acolyte, slices out the door, hops a rickety bicycle, pedals tiptoe, clawed up by that regal bird on his back into the forgetful mysterium of night, sirens already heralding his shrouded arrival, his glorious departure. This kid had some style, his getaway vehicle was a bicycle. And they asked me to hang around till the cops came, but I split. Um, I I read this poem. We were we weren't we talking at um, we were talking at dinner about baptism, weren't we? Yeah. So I want to read a baptism poem. <clears throat> then I'll maybe maybe read two more and take some questions, or I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, maybe I'll read three more. I'm looking at the clock. I have a few, a few minutes. I don't want to keep it too long. Um, one time I was giving a reading at a college where I, I was, and one of, the, one of the students asked one of my colleagues, a buddy of mine, like, how long will this reading be? He said, it'll probably be about 40, 45 minutes, but it'll seem way longer. Um, <coughs> I was teaching at... Um, Mitchell Community College, I've, I've spent a whole lot of time teaching in community colleges, almost, I've spent the better part of 25 years teaching in, in community colleges. Um, and when I was at Mitchell, uh, uh, one of my students, who was an older student, um, probably 10 years younger than, than, than I am, um, who grew up Methodist, decided she wanted to be Catholic, you know, she wanted to convert. And, and I grew up really Orthodox Catholic, um, although I'm technically excommunicated because uh, I married a Southern Baptist woman in Indian Creek Baptist Church, and that was the end of everything, of course. Um, so she, en she seized on me as kind of her sponsor, as kind of this model Catholic. And, and, and I am constitutionally Catholic, but, but I haven't, and I'm not really being a smart aleck. I haven't paid attention to, like, a lot of the rules, and I don't agree with all of them. Um, but I helped her through this process, and she converted. And then her three daughters, um, they, they, two of them, well, all three of them now, had babies out of wedlock. And she wanted th her grandchildren to be baptized by the parish priest. But he refused because the babies were born out of wedlock, which I disagree vehemently with that kind of judgmentalism when it comes to babies. So she asked me if I'd baptize them. <laughs> so I said, of course, you know, um, because the Catholic Catechism states that in the, 
in emergencies, anyone can baptize. And I decided, I think, I thought hard about it, that it was an emergency, that these kids, they were children. Let them be welcomed into the world. God bless them, christen them, etc. And um, so I have a little epigraph here. You guys have all seen these things, these head notes that come before poems. It says, in cases of necessity, any person may baptize the Catholic catechism. So um, my wife and I, you know, bought them christening gowns and had the kinds of celebrations we had for our own kids, for these, for these kids. And um, I'm certainly glad to, to perform any kind of religious rite if I need to while, while here. So this is called Julian, which is the, the little boy's name, who's now 13. In christening gown and bonnet, he is white and stoic as the moon. Unflinching as the sun burns through yellow puffs of pine, pollen gathered at his crown, while I pour onto his forehead from a tiny blue Chinese rice cup holy water, blessed by John Paul II himself, and say, I baptize you, Julian Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Nor does he stir when the monarchs and swallowtails and ecclesiastical vestments lift from the purple brushes of the butterfly bush in light upon him. And that really happened, you know, we were next to the butterfly bushes and all the butterflies came and landed on the baby. It was quite beautiful, miraculous actually. So I'll read two more poems and then I'll, I'll be glad to take um, questions. I want to read a poem called Advising, um, which is kind of dedicated to um, all of my old students. Um, when, it, when I taught in community colleges, one of the miraculous things that I felt about them. You know, my heart's still here. You know, there's 58 of them in, in North Carolina, and they're all situated geographically, so every citizen in the state is within commuting distance of an open-door education that is affordable. What a beautiful kind of concept, you know. Um, in a lot of community colleges, um, one of the great things about community colleges is Older people can come back and get educated, which is, that's no big deal now, but it was it, years ago. Like by the time you got to a certain age, people would say they were too old to get, education, to get educated. Thank goodness we're over that. But I had a lot of students who would get out of high school, um, try to make a go of it, realize that that was really going to be a tough road to hoe, although some would have kids along the way and were in dead-end jobs and, and realized they wanted to come back. In all the statistics, you know, this is part of the commercial, too, about stay in school and get that sheepskin. All the statistics say that the people, well, we know that the people who get college degrees make more money. They're physically healthier. They're mentally healthier. Their children have much better lives. I mean, so those are all pretty good reasons, you know, because our dreams always remain with our children. So often these older people... Um, and when I say older, they might have been like in their late 20s or early 30s. They, they were, a lot of them were, were single parents, single mothers. So this poem is simply about um, an instance where I was advising a woman who had come back and was just having a tough time doing it all together and getting it all together, and she had her little boy with him. Um, and this is called Advising. And it mentions remedial um, Developmental classes were called remedial, you know, way, way back in, you know, troglodyte times. Advising. The woman I advise tests into remedial. I explain the courses she must take before she actually accrues college credit. We both refer to them as brush up. She works a 10 to 6 a.m. shift at the Sarah Lee factory 40 miles east in the next county. Her plan is to clock out, come to school for a couple hours each morning, then go home and sleep before it all starts up again. The boy with her is named Jason. He throws a yellow ball, then trips after it. Just turned three in October, she corrects me, when I guess too high at his age. Tall and handsome, orangish hair curling around his caramel face, pacifier, Dallas cowboy sweats. Swelling out of the little desk, the woman's distracted, big, blonde, her skin, factory white, nothing to write with. So I give her my pen and guide her 
through the federal funding questionnaire, AFDC, JTPA, VA, VR, GED, various impairments. Jason chases the ball about the classroom. Come here, she says repeatedly, though he pays no attention. Then he wheels and whips the ball at me. I try to catch it, but it hits me instead in the chest. You're a bad boy, Jason, she barks. That man is going to get you. <laughs> the boy looks at me. His eyes are blue. He's not a bad boy, I say. You want him? She shoots back. <laughs> Jason stares at me, spit dribbling off the end of the pacifier. Yes, I answer. I'm going to go on and leave you here with this man, she scolds. Before I can say another word, the boy starts crying. His face fills with water, the nipple of the dripping pacifier visible as he opens his mouth to catch his breath. She hoists him onto her desktop, and he begins to hush, heaving every few seconds, holding on to her T-shirt. Where's your ball, she asks then to me. I'm crazy, ain't I? I smile but can't think of the thing to say. I tell her to sign above my signature, then direct her to the registrar's office where she'll have to pay. She slides the baby to her. As she lifts him and rises, I see that his pants are sopping. He leaves a trail of wet along the formica. Bye, Jason, I call, but he seems asleep, his ball still sitting in my lap, his urine on the desktop catching light from the window. And then one more, and then I'm, again, I'm glad, really glad to take... Uh, Really glad to take questions. Does anybody have any requests? No? It's kind of a trick question. There's no reason for you to have requests. If you name a subject, I'll read a poem on it, though. Can't be sports. I mean, I've done that to death now already. You got it, buddy. I mean, I got one love poem after another, though, man. I mean, just one after another. Um, okay, this is this is a poem. Um, this is a poem f for my wife. Um, it's it's a title the title poem of this book, which is called Land of Amnesia. And that very beautiful woman on the cover is my wife. And please don't think I'm robbing the cradle either. She's a little older than that now, but she's um, fifty times more beautiful. Um, in, in hang in there, because here goes, love. And then I'll take questions. Land of amnesia. I swear, given even this much of a fool's chance at the end, I'd beg to cross one last time the Rocky River into Anson County. I'd ask you to come, and if you'd so consent, I'd forswear tobacco and shun drink, but the bill of sale this time would be forever. No last-minute dickering over the route, no trips to the conjure woman like Lot's lying wife. I'll not have you looking back. We'll hold Jesus to his writ promise of forgiveness. Not in such tongue as folks might reckon, but signs, Bodeman, two nights bloody sun over all souls' church, shades in the vesture of deer, your hand in mine atop Lord Anson's Bible. Over Cedar Hill and Pinkston, we'll shin the tar roads and foxtrots, critter quit but for snakes and oat grass, even a mincing moon off cotton will yield light enough to walk by. In the morning, I'll be there with sweet milk. We'll watch the sun break out of the crop shroud like a born in baby, lustering the break, wild banshee turkey sailing out of it. If we make Brownie's trailer by lunch, he'll put us up something field peas and hoe cakes, blueberry honey. From his firmament, the Lord will fix us in the crosshairs of his holy roads. 109 and 1634, Big Davis on the shoulder, black as old road bed, hitching into Wadesboro for a jug of wine at the shot house. A game of nine ball clacking out the open door of Deese's speakeasy, two mule carts and a pickup with a tethered blue tick chalked in the gravel. From here, it's not but a mile and a half to the infallen arsoned house where we first dwelt. But you were bound to be frighted. 
It gets fen and swampy. River runs under this murmury ground. You can smell the charred hard pine, turpentine, what boiled out in the fire. Pitch so fast an instant bird flocks that lit there sing still roosting by their petrified bones. Nailed across the door is a whiffle tree. Mrs. Little's thorns still thrive. The old bay star dead two decades. Canners in the pasture. Cotton fetches two bits of bale. In the sky dart lights of other craft. There's no one we can tell about this. No one who would ever allow it. Behind us pitches the crazed compass needle. Our lives of other counties long forgotten. Burn up like hair locks in a candle. It is here, my best beloved We'll build on ruin. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're, you're, you're fabulous. Um, I'm glad to answer questions if you got them. Question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. I, I talked a little bit about that in, in Ms. Sykes' class today. Um, I guess when I was, you know, the earliest I was introduced to poetry, probably like you all, was Mother Goose in a lot of ways. Um, Mary had a little lamb, and its fleece, fleece was white as snow. And, and I could go on, and you could too. Um, probably the next time I encountered it, um, I encountered it in school somewhere, and it was kind of formal poems. Whose woods these are, I think I know. Whose house is in the village, though. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a horn uh, farmhouse there. Uh, he gives his harness bells a shake to see if there's been some mistake. Your woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep him miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. So that's kind of formal poem, formal in that it has a decided rhythm and meter that's repeated in a rhyme scheme. So I kind of grew up with that kind of poetry just because of the time that I was born. Okay, so then I've, I've, I started, I went to this really cool high school that I mentioned before, and I had these really far out teachers who began to put certain books in my hands and certain poems, and they were also bringing in music um, and we were treating that like text, Simon and Garfunkel, um, Jefferson Air Airplanes, Volunteers, Let It Be by the Rolling Stones, all sorts of far out stuff, you know, and they were saying, these are poems too. So I would say that to you, your music are poems too. Um, but a lot of those didn't rhyme, you know, and they had narrative, they took stories on. So for me, it was reading more and just having teachers who said, Check this out. Look at this. Look at that. So I began to read more and more. And, and um, you know, it just took me a long time to figure that out and to begin to kind of tap my own life in a lot of ways. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, the great Georgia writer, says if you survive your childhood, you have enough to write about for the rest of your life. So you really, predicated on that, have enough to write about for the rest of your life. I think we're just encouraged by film and all these big things in the media to feel like our, our small day-to-day -day lives aren't important, but there's nothing more important. John Updike, the great American writer, says that uh, the most important things happen in a kitchen, and I think that's true. So I, don't, I hope that sort of gets around towards your question. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, um, is that Samantha? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your hair is down, I think. Yeah. I'm surprised. I don't even have my glasses on, you know. I was just hoping it was you. I guess what I thought, uh, th what I thought, like sort of a man did who went to college, and I'm the first person with my name to go to college. I always saw myself with like a, an attaché case, like a briefcase, in those awful kind of like hard black shoes and some kind of really square looking suit, like getting on the streetcar. And every time I saw myself like that, I sort of would get a little sick at my stomach, you know. Um, but I had this idea, too, I was going to be a lawyer, 
Um, and my mother, to her dying day, even though I was about 53 when she died, still expected me to, like, apply to law school, you know. Like, um, so I thought being a lawyer would be kind of romantic, you know. I, I fancied myself, um, you know, defending the poor and downtrodden and all of that. Um, so I, di I didn't want to do anything that kept me at a desk or kept me tethered. I, I was extra unsuccessful with jobs before I started teaching, like extra, fired or quit. Often, I don't even want to talk about it. I mean, it was, it was there were even raised voices a couple times, you know. I mean, so, so I, I, I thought, ooh, I have to choose wisely here, you know. I don't do really well, you know. Um, so... I didn't want to, you know, this feels to me like the only job I could have, you know, poet laureate. No, no, I mean, teaching, teaching. It's been a great life for me. I, it feels like the only job I could have had, in, in, and I've been, not to put too fine a point on this, I, I've, I've had success teaching, but I, I just didn't see myself being successful. My boredom quotient, I mean, my threshold for boredom has always been so low. Um, so I'm lucky. I mean, I'm extra, extra lucky, but I try to say everywhere I go, no one gets anywhere by himself, you know. I mean, I have had so much help from so many people along the line. I mean, starting with, you know, starting especially with my mother and father, you know, who just kind of went to work and did the job and didn't ask for any kind of recognition whatsoever. Um, and then teachers and then all the invisible people that help us, the people we don't even know are helping us. So I didn't want to do anything else. I just didn't want I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So so here's what happened. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Um you know I kind of <laughs> the prison was kind of my laboratory for learning how to teach, because I didn't know anything about teaching, you know, I, I just didn't. So, a lot of it was really extra basic stuff, because the literacy rate in prison is just terrible. Um, and people go to prison, I mean, pe people go to prison because they're poor and uneducated. I mean, there are other reasons, but they're poor and uneducated. You can, you know, people can say whatever they want, but you don't go in there and find educated, wealthy people. You know, we hear about those people in those federal joints, but you go into state joints, probably Rockingham County has one. We are blessed with prisons in North Carolina. So go visit one and see all the Rhodes Scholars and all the Princeton graduates in prison. Um, so I went in and was just trying to teach people how to, how, often how to read, you know, but I didn't know how to do that. My wife, who was actually assigned to the same VISTA project, I met her the very first day of training. Um, she taught me how to eat grits. She's from Georgia, and, and I was completely befuddled by, by the grits. Um, she's actually had degrees in teaching, and she knew how, how to do that. And then we did adult basic education and GED. And then I wanted to be a writer, but I hadn't written anything either. I didn't know what that was. So I started kind of a creative writing class in prison, and just I learned how to sort of do that while they were sort of learning how to write. And it meant everything because a lot of guys and women in prison are very talented, almost kind of strangely ingenious, but that talent, even their athletic talent, goes into other stuff, you know, for whatever reason, you know, that fork in the road. So, um, and I felt, I really felt like I wasn't that much different when, than them when I showed up. I, I grew up in a really tough, tough neighborhood. Some of you um, know Phil Conti here. Um, do you all know Professor Conti? He and I grew up in the same neighborhood. We went to the same high school. He, I mean, he could tell you. I mean, it was, it's, it's kind of a bombed out area now. And a lot of those kids were brilliant and talented, but it was a tough time racially, drugs, the country was changing, and the people veered off in other directions, you know. So um, it's one of those things where I really felt they gave more to me than I gave to them. I know that's hard to explain, 
but it, but it is true. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the latter, just kind of writing about what happened to me and what happened in the past, but there's nothing terrifically unique about my story, you know, I don't think, um, it's, a, it, it's what I would call a kind of shared humanity, I mean, even talking about like, okay, what are you going to do, I mean, everybody hits that fork in the road, um, you hit multiple forks in the road, and, and there's a certain pressure on young people your age, to, to declare that you're going to do this thing, but you don't know what it is, you know, and you've gone to college and you're supposed to be successful. Although I think it's way tougher on you guys now because there's so much more competition. There's so many more of you. There's so many people being educated. Technology's gone hog wild and, and that idea about keeping up. Everything's so much more expensive. We were talking, coming back from dinner, how much gas was when we started um, in, in Gas was 23 cents a gallon when I got my driver's license. And, and so if you had like four guys in the car and everybody threw a quarter at you, you know, you could drive 100 miles. You know, try that now. So um, <laughs> I, I, think, I, think it's I think it is kind of universal, you know. People's hearts break. They fall in love. They love their parents. They hate their parents. They do the best they can. I think those things continue to, to go on and on. I mean, read Shakespeare. It's the same you know, it's, it's basically the same stuff. People want to get stuff. There are people that want to keep them from getting it, you know. Anybody else? Well, thanks a million for coming. You're a great audience. Thank you. Thank you so much.